Here's something that'll be familiar to generations of people from the US. It's the show and tell, the home entertainment system for children. It first appeared on the market in the 1960s, but remained on sale in one guise or another up until the mid-1980s. General Electric announced it to the press in 1964, and it went on sale in October of that year, just ready for the holiday period, at a price of $29.95 for the player, and the programmes came in at 99 cents each, or you could get a pack of five for $4.95, representing a saving of zero cents. A programme consists of a slideshow and an accompanying 7-inch 33 rpm record. There are a total of 35 programmes available at launch, covering a variety of genres from fairy tales, cartoons, children's favourites, as well as educational material, such as history and science and space. It's clear the product was an immediate sales success, because by the time this advert came out in 1965, the number of programmes available for it had gone up to 140. There's a bit more information about them here. It says each programme is nearly four minutes long and consists of a 33 and a third record, plus a show film of 15 colour slides. In addition, it mentions it can just be used as a standard four-speed phonograph too, so it can play your collection of 16 and two thirds, 33 and a third, 45 and 78 RPM records. Now the model that I've got here that I imported from the US came from perhaps 15 to 20 years after those initial advertisements. This is from the 1980s, at which point it was being sold by Gabriel, but it works on exactly the same basis. On the front here we've got a switch where we can just use it as a record player, and then if we move it across to the viewer position the screen comes on and we can use it as a slideshow viewer. Now on the top of this one we've only got the two speeds now, 45 RPM and 33 and a third. This one's missing its rest for the tone arm, but if I just put the arm out of the way, you can see underneath there we've got a red lever which adjusts the focus of the images shown on the screen, and then behind there is a slot where you insert this strip of slides. So let's have a look at in action. I'll show you some snippets out of this one. This is a licensed Disney property, the Aristocats. You get the 7 inch 33 and a third record, and then also inside that folder you get the strip of 15 slides, and that gets pushed all the way down inside the machine. I found with this machine it's best to rotate the turntable a couple of times anti-clockwise, that just gets everything a little bit more in sync. And I'll dim the lights and we can just have a look at a couple of clips out of this programme. One day, Madame Von Famille told her lawyer, I want to make out my will. I will leave my entire fortune to my aristocrats. Then, when they die, everything goes to Edgar, my faithful butler. Edgar, who overheard the old lady, didn't need much time to figure out that the sooner the cats died, the sooner he'd inherit the fortune. Anyway, one day Edgar served the Aristocats their usual saucer of warm milk, which the cats drank, then promptly fell asleep. As usual, I too sipped the cats' dinner, and I too fell asleep. When I awoke, the cats were gone. Confronted by this evidence, Edgar confessed he had drugged the cats by mixing sleeping medicine in their milk. Then he tied them up tightly in a burlap bag and left them for dead in a nearby forest. Now, if you're wondering why the sound was so good, well, it wasn't coming from the internal speaker on the show and tell. I've had to dub it over later because the show and tell I imported from the US has a DC motor. So it's expecting a 60 hertz electrical signal. And in the UK, we've only got 50 hertz, which means it plays too slowly. So I've got a sine wave converter with a step down power transformer. But unfortunately, that produces a very noisy signal. Just to give you a demonstration, here's what it sounded like to me. They were baffled when they arrived, more baffled when they left. Could it be the work of Edgar? Nonsense, said the old lady. Edgar, I trust completely. Everything worked fine, it was just, it had that annoying buzz on it, which I thought you probably wouldn't appreciate having to listen to throughout this video, so that's why I've redubbed those sections with audio I recorded on a separate record player. One of my favourite things about these discs is on the reverse of them you get an extra track which is related to the original subject matter. There's no slides to go along with this, but it's a funky 1960s version of Pop Goes the Weasel. Let's just have a listen.
Now, the world changed quite considerably between 1964 and the early 1980s. It's interesting to see how the show and tell tried to keep up with those changes. This is one of the earliest releases. This is from 1964. It's in a textured cardboard folder that they seem to drop pretty quickly. And the strip of slides itself is held within cardboard. By the time the 70s have rolled around, they've replaced the photo that was previously used on the outside of the packaging to indicate what was inside with a slightly creepy hand-drawn illustration. Also, inside the folder, there's no additional information on the left-hand side anymore. On the 60s ones, there were sometimes things there that related to what was on the disc. The slideshow itself is now held within a more resilient piece of plastic. The cardboard ones seem to quite often get folded over at the top where people had shoved them into the machine. Also down the sides of this, there are steps on it now which help it to advance through the mechanism. The cardboard had a tendency to slip. As far as the 1980s ones are concerned, other than another redesign of the packaging, the contents are roughly the same as the 1970s. It's just what's on them that really changed. If we look back to the earliest days, 1964, this Treasure Island, you can see on the back of here there's only a small number of alternate titles available, so these are the initial ones, and there's already a big emphasis on education. Move forward to 1965, we can see in here, as well as fairy tales and things, we've got mythology, sports biography, explorers, adventure stories, tales from Shakespeare, farm animals, learn through music, how to read maps, learn Spanish, prehistoric life, history, the earth in space, volume one, science and space, the world we live in, all very much education based. Taking a look on the back of this 1970s release to see what titles were available then, and it reveals quite a big change from the 60s. The size of the catalogue has significantly reduced, and the titles that are available have moved more towards the entertainment end. There are still a fair number of education titles in there, but the majority of it is made up of licensed material, particularly from people like Disney. However, move on to the 1980s version of the show and tell, and the education side's pretty much got out of the window by this point. Well, there are some edutainment titles from Sesame Street, but really there aren't that many titles here to choose from overall. It's a product that's on its way out. It's a far cry from the glory days of the mid-1960s when children would eagerly gather around their show and tell to watch a biography of Winston Churchill. This is quite an interesting title because it came out in 1965. You can see the copyright date at the bottom there, but look a little bit further up, you can see the years that Churchill lived for, 1874 to 1965. So it came out on the year he died, so it was quite topical at the time it was released. Let's just take a quick look at it. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. And they fought magnificently. The British Royal Air Force, outnumbered four to one, inflicted so much damage on the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force, that again and again Hitler postponed his invasion. Now you should have noticed something by now. All the ones I've shown you have exhibited fading. The colours pretty much got out of them. You might not have noticed it too much with the Churchill one there because most of those pictures would have been black and white, but originally these things should have been colour. And you can see most of the colours have gone. We're left mostly with shades of red. Look at Let's Paint Pictures here. Yeah, Let's Paint Pictures in light shades of pink. That's uh, not what it would have looked like originally. And unfortunately, this is the same with all of the ones I've got. And it's worse with some of the older ones. This looks like it was black and white. I mean, there's very little colour on here at all, but this would have been vibrant colour. You can see an example of how it should look from the cover. But I want to show you a little bit of this, not just because it's faded, but because the story moves along at a ridiculous pace. Just have a listen to this. It's Treasure Island! Hi! <laughs> Jim Hawkins, it's your map that brought us here. Pirate Flint's treasure is buried right over there, sir. Long John Silver and the crew had mutinied. Jim sees them attack the stockade, trying to kill the captain, the doctor, and three loyal men. Get the map and take the gold in the ship. Nineteen pirates against five men and a boy. Avast there! Who are you? I'm poor Ben Gunn for three years maroon. Left to die, Jim. But today I'm rich. Long John mutinied. I'm with you. Jim tells the captain about Ben Gunn, his boat, and secret cave. Great news, Jim. We'll move to Ben's hideout and lick the pirates yet. 
they've tried to squeeze a whole television series there down to under four minutes and it hasn't quite worked out it sounds like a load of gibberish however anyone making a program for the show and tell has to be quite careful how they structure it because it isn't as clever as it looks every release has to fit the same format a four minute record and a new slide appearing approximately every 15 seconds <laughs> What do clocks tell us? Clocks tell us when it's time to get up, when it's time to go to school, when it's time for lunch, when it's time to play, time to go to a party, and when it's time to go to bed. So the discs that work best are the ones that are quite leisurely paced. There'll be approximately 10 seconds or so worth of talking, then a bit of a pause while the new slide moves into place, followed by a further 10 seconds or so of talking. Those slides are appearing at regular intervals. There's no pulses or synchronization track or anything on the disc. They just get automatically advanced onto the next one. Now I'll try and open up the player a little bit here because I want to show you how simple the mechanism is inside this. Although I struggled to get it completely apart, I didn't want to snap anything, so I'm going to have to show you through this small opening I've made. So on the centre spindle of the record, and underneath of that, you can see there's a worm gear. Uh, that is turning a tooth gear, and then off to the right-hand side, that copper coloured thing is the drive shaft leading to the mechanism which advances the slides. And all that does is move them up every 15 seconds or so. It's as simple as that, there's nothing more complicated going on in here. To get the record perfectly in sync with the slides, on the early discs they had this arrow on the label which you were supposed to line up with a spot on the right hand side. The later discs dropped that idea, presumably because they just allowed themselves a little bit more leeway so the slides and audio could get a little bit out of sync without anyone really noticing. I want to finish this video by giving you a full show and tell presentation from the 80s. Unfortunately, the three titles I've got, one has the record and no slides, the other one has the slides but no record, however the third one has got both, but the record's a little bit scratchy on the side I'll be playing you. It's a Superman disc, and as you can see from looking at these slides, the colours are nice and vibrant, that's why I was choosing an 80s one, but it's also got a very strange recording on side B, so I'll just play you a little bit of that. Now traveling in space at the speed of light. You are in a state of weightlessness. Begin the flight navigation. Reach your right arm to the right and push the throttle of the right rocket thruster. Push, push, push. Now reach your left arm to the left and push the throttle of the left rocket thruster. Push, push. Perhaps that would also come in handy if you were having a baby. Anyway, I'm going to play the whole of side A now together with the slides. The disc on side A was quite badly scratched, all worn down. It has a nasty crackle all the way through it. I've put some noise reduction on here, which reduces it down significantly from what it originally was, but it still doesn't sound perfect. But anyway, here we go. Superman, disguised as mild-mannered reporter Clark Kent, is about to be honoured. And now, the reporter of the year, Clark Kent. Uh-oh, my super hearing is picking up the sound of fire alarms. There must be a big blaze somewhere. I've got to get out of here fast. Er, uh, thanks, Lois. Gotta run. Clark, you forgot your award. Hmm, I wonder where he's going. This looks like a job for Superman. It sounds like the Metropolis Fire Department is on the way. I'd better locate the fire quickly. They may need my help. Up here, I can get a bird's eye view of the city. There's the fire. And a lot of people live there. I'd better find the fire chief to see how I can help. Superman, am I glad to see you. Most of the fire is under control, but it's still burning over there, and I've got no more men to spare. I'll see what I can do. It'll take a lot of water to get this fire under control, and this looks like just the right place to find all the water we'll need. Good. The 
water is flowing onto the roof and down through the building to put out the flames. But it sounds like my job isn't over yet. Help! Help! That firefighter's falling. I'd better pour on the speed. <clears throat> Don't worry, you're in safe hands. Superman, there's a little boy in that building. He thought I was a monster when he saw me in my mask. You've got to find him. That building's awfully smoky. I'd better hurry. That little boy must be hiding near here. Help! Please help! My super hearing is picking up a cry for help in the next room. Help! Help! Superman, please save me from the fire monster. I hid until they went away. I've got something important to tell you, son. But first, let's get out of here. Superman, you found him. Thank goodness. And wrapped in my fireproof cape. Getting him out of that burning building was no problem. Hey, you're no monster. You're a firefighter. That's right. This mask is part of my uniform. If I didn't wear it, I couldn't stay inside a burning building long enough to help people. That's right. When you're in a fire and you see someone who looks a little scary, don't run away. Run towards him. Take my word for it. That's one great safety tip. Great advice from Superman there. Remember, when you're in a fire, make sure you run towards someone who looks scary. Anyway, that's it for the moment. As always, thanks for watching.